Good evening. Thank you for joining us here at Central Church of Christ for our Wednesday night Bible study. I hope you're all doing well. I hope that the storms that passed through on Sunday did not do uh, damage to you or, or terrible damage to your homes or, or anything like that. I hope you've been able to uh, just make it through unscathed. I know Bailey and Benji and I were, were a little uh, put off by it. We actually ended up going to Memphis Sunday night so that we could have a, a house with electricity because we thought it was going to be out for a while. Uh, but we're back now. We're doing well. Everything's got power so far. And uh, at least until the next storm, we'll be just fine. Uh, tonight, our goal is going to be to dive into some of the deeper parts of Daniel. As you know, we've been studying Daniel for the past few weeks, and we've covered chapters 1 through 6, which are really a bunch of uh, character stories and character studies into different examples of faith and, and lessons of how to deal with adversity and, and trial and how to grow from it. But as we reach into Daniel 7 and, and going from there through Daniel chapter 12, the end of the book, we're going to be reading all these different prophecies. And they're known as apocryphal prophecies. And I know that sounds frightening or a little uh, something that might put us off because it, it, it's a big word. I know when I first started reading into it and diving into it, it's, it's hard to understand. It's hard to get over. But really, the gist of it is just prophecy regarding judgment and the future and how things are going to happen. And it still may be hard to dissect. I mean, we're going to read through some things that uh, many scholars, people much smarter than me, don't have answers for. And uh, we're just going to have to do our best to understand God's word and, and put our best foot forward so that we can uh, show God and, and establish this learning heart and a, a heart that desires to be more like God and know what he has said and, and what he's done. But before we begin, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have tonight just to study in your word and to learn more about how you have done things and how you have uh, enacted your plan according to the world. Father, we pray that we will take what we learn and apply it to our own faith to where we can see you in action all around us to grow our, our love and desire for you. I pray all these things for your son's name. Amen. This evening, as I've said, we're going to be studying Daniel uh, chapter 7 tonight. And I know we've been kind of taking off one or two chapters tonight, but as we've gotten in, or going, as we're getting into these deeper passages, I think we may only end up being able to do one chapter a night just because of how much material there is in there to break down. So tonight we're going to study Daniel chapter 7, and it's a story of Daniel, God's plan revealed. Because Daniel is going to have multiple visions. And in chapter 7, he's, he has a vision of four beasts. And in chapter 8, he has a vision of two beasts. And it just goes on and on until he just has a, a fuller picture of God's plan. And it's just being revealed to Daniel. And what we see in Daniel chapter 7, if you'll open with me, in Daniel chapter 7, in Daniel chapter 7 and starting in verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon... Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then I looked, its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up from among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and the mouth speaking great things." Daniel chapter 7 is this first main vision that we get. I know we've read of, of Nebuchadnezzar's visions of, of uh, famines and uh, just different things that were going to happen to the kingdom of Babylon that, that Daniel was able to interpret for Nebuchadnezzar. But here we get the first of, of Daniel's visions, dreams that he has had, see, things that he has seen from God. In fact, what we're going to see is that he has to turn to uh, other uh, 
other people that God has blessed with interpretation, whether it's a, a man or it's a, an angel that God sends. But what we see in Daniel chapter 7 is that Daniel 7 begins with a date, the first year of Belshazzar, and that's when this vision comes in. Now, from different sources, this could have been in uh, 553 BC, it could have been all the way up to 549 BC, so really it's, it's about a, a four-year gap in there that, that this could fall. And if we recall to last week, we remember Belshazzar. Belshazzar was a son of, of Nebuchadnezzar. He was a wicked king who was punished for his pride and wickedness. Remember, he, he went and took the vessels of gold and silver that his father had taken from the temple of God and commanded they brought be, that they be brought before him so that he and his buddies could, take, uh, to, could drink out of them and, and use them as just regular glasses when they were intended for holy use. And because of that, that pride, that sin, that wickedness, he's punished. In fact, he's the last of the Babylonian kings we read about, and he's into, he ends up being defeated by Darius in the Medo-Persians. And so what we see is Daniel is dating his first vision to that first year of Belshazzar. And from that, we know that it's going to be a few years before the fall of Babylon. So these visions are preceding what's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. And that's what makes these, these visions so uh, amazing, that they're a, a glimpse into the future for Daniel and for his people. Now, I do want to mention as we begin that I, that I believe the four beasts that Daniel sees are meant to be frightening. They're meant to strike fear into the people. They come up out of the sea showing a, a worldliness to them, that they're a, a worldly uh, beast or animal. And we'll get more into that comparison later on. But they're meant to be frightening. Each one of these beasts are going to be worse than the one that preceded it. But when we get to the end of the vision, we're going to see that there's a reason for joy, for hope, for happiness, and, and not something that is so frightening or fearful. But this vision is perhaps one of my favorite uh, stories or, or lessons in the Bible because of how, uh, how great the use of imagery is in it. And let's really break it down. What we see is that Daniel sees four beasts. And we're going to see what those beasts are, and, and we're going to try and understand it as we go on. But it begins with a lion with eagle wings. Now, I don't know how many of you have, have studied into mythology or just looked into that, but there's one animal that makes me think of this, that, that so many myths or, or legends have, have talked about, and that's a griffin, where it's, where it's a lion with wings, it's, it can fly, it's, it's, it's a scary thought. I mean, when you go to a zoo and you see a lion, you know that that's a, a beast of power, it can uh, tear apart uh, animals, people so easily, and, and all of a sudden it's given wings? Man, that's frightening. And here we see that that's the very first beast this story begins with, a lion that has wings. Secondly, we see a bear with ribs in its mouth. And man, if that would not be frightening to see. I mean, think about it. If you're walking along in, in the forest or in a, a nature preserve and you see a bear just standing up on its hind legs and it's got ribs of an animal in its teeth and you know it's just, it's, it sees you. Man, that would, that would send a chill down my spine. It'd be so frightening. I, I'd probably grab my family and I'd run right out of there. I wouldn't want to be near that thing because who knows what it would turn to. And what we see with this beast is that not only does it look scary, but it's been given a, an even scarier goal. Its goal is to de devour much flesh. It's supposed to go out and continue eating, causing havoc and chaos and become this destructive force. But, but, after it comes another beast that's not only just as frightening, but even more so. And after this beast, what we see, I apologize, I think something, there we go. After this beast, what we see is uh, a beast that is even scarier. We see a leopard with four heads and four wings. Man, I mean, we just talked about a lion with wings. Now imagine a leopard, a leopard who is known to attack unprovoked for those who, who walk by it or may not even see that it's there. Imagine that now with four heads, so four different ways that it could it tear apart and, and four wings so that it can fly and basically be anywhere it needs to be. And not only is it this scary, but it's been given dominion. So, so I mean, this is a progression as we see from these beasts. The first beast didn't have dominion or, or a goal. It was just a, a tool of, of fear. Sec the second beast had a goal to devour what was before it. The third beast has dominion. It has power and authority over all that came before it. And it, it's even more frightening than what became. And then the fourth beast is, is the absolute worst. 
It's an exceedingly dreadful beast. I mean, we look at what Daniel describes it as. It's, it's terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It has great iron teeth. It devours in broken pieces and stamped what was left before it. Man, what a scary, scary sight. In some of the commentaries I, I was looking at, it didn't even look like an animal. It just looked like a monster, something you'd see in a, a uh, cartoon or um, just a scary movie. It's that frightening. And on top of that, it had 10 horns on its head. Man, that's a frightening beast. And, and Daniel, once he, he finishes seeing these beasts, is so visibly shaken. He's so uh, scared by what he sees. I mean, we look down in, in verse 15 of chapter 7, and it says, As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the vision of my head alarmed me. Man, I mean, imagine waking up from that. You're, you're deep in sleep, and you just see these animals, and they're scary. And not only are they scary, but there's another one that comes after that's even more frightening than the one before it. And you wake up and you're sweating and you're, you're catching your breath because you are afraid of what you've seen. Not only are you afraid, but you don't know what it means. And you're, so you have to seek it out. And we're going to get to the interpretation of this dream in just a moment. But I think we do need to continue on in, in kind of the timeline of this chapter. Because that's not the end of the vision. The beast are, are the first frightening part, but there's more to it. We see as this vision continues, if you'll read with me in verse 9, that we get a... a change of scenery, so to speak. In verse 9, it says this, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued, and it came out before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Like I said, we're, we're given this change of scenery. And in this change of scenery, we, you know, we've just had this vision of those beasts, and they're frightening, but we're introduced to the Ancient of Days, which I believe is referring to God. It's God that they're talking, or that Daniel is seeing right here. And the Ancient of Days, as they call him, sits on his throne. And it's an image of him that, that we really should recognize. Because what we see is, is that as he's revealed, his description can only be referring to God. He is pure and blameless, which is shown by his clothing and his hair. I mean, we think of songs that we sing where we talk about being white as snow, or how Jesus was as white as snow, or, or how they're blameless. That's what this is describing, that the Ancient of Days is blameless, is pure, is holy. On top of that, we see that he is the one who can truly judge. Because when we look at what he's talking about, how his throne was fiery flames, and there's fire coming out from him, and the wheels are burning fire. The fire is a symbol of God's judgment and guidance, as seen all throughout the Old Testament. Think of the Israelites as they're, they're leaving Egypt. They're led by a, a pillar of fire. Think of, uh, of the prophets of Baal when they go up against God and, and Elijah. God uses fire to devour the, the prophets and the, the idolatry that is there. God uses fire to show his judgment, his power, and how he has complete authority over others. And on top of this, we see that not only is this, this God who is pure and holy and, and has the righteous judgment that, that we expect from him, but he is served by a grand number. David, or I apologize, Daniel is using a multiplication table there in verse 10. 10,000 times 10,000 serve him. I don't think we're meant to take the, the exact number here and think, oh, well, that's 100,000 are serving God. But it's a symbol that, that, God's, grant, that God's servants are, are innumerable. That they're, they're so far more vast than we might think. The Ancient of Days is God. And he's in complete control. 
And that's what this vision goes to. And I, I mentioned that we go from this frightening scene to something that is peaceful, and, and or maybe not peaceful, but joyful. Because we see as this goes on that the Ancient of Days is in complete control. The Ancient of Days, as this vision progresses, deals with the beasts. They're destroyed. In fact, I think we need to notice how abrupt this is. That in verse 11, that the beast who is, is currently speaking words to the Ancient of Days is destroyed like that. That it's killed, its body is destroyed, and it's delivered to be burned. That's abrupt. That's a, a sign that God is done. That God is done with that beast, that, that wickedness that is proceeding from its mouth, and that he is finished with it. Isn't that a, a wonderful image? That God, when he is dealing with wickedness, with, with terror, with, with anything that might strike fear in us, it can be done so quickly and so, so finite, finitely that it will be over. That's how God deals with those who are judged wicked. That's how God deals with this kingdom that he has seen as wicked. And not only is it with this last final beast, but it's for the rest of the beasts as well, who are, I think are given a little lesser sentence. That their dominion is taken away, but then they're allowed to kind of live out their days until they're no more. That one day their time will come and it'll be bad. But man, God, the Ancient of Days, has the power, complete power, and we see that in this vision. And it, it changes again that, that it goes from this frightening and intense scene to a joyful scene at the end. Because the Son of Man comes and is given the ultimate dominion. And I think there really are a few things we need to note about the Son of Man. And not only the Son of Man, but the difference between the beasts and the Son of Man. The Son of Man, as we see in verse 9, or I apologize, not verse 9, but in verse 13, comes from a divine location. He's coming from the clouds of heaven. And when we look at the beasts of, of, of the vision in verse 4, or I apologize, verse 3, they, they come out, out of the sea. So one group of, of rulers come from the world. They're worldly creations. They're, they're worldly rulers. And then the other comes from a divine location. He comes from the heavens. On top of this, this change in where they come from or their origin is the power that the people have. Or, or not only the people, but, but the Son of Man compared to the beasts. We see that the Son of Man has true power. He has true power because his dominion is everlasting. It, it's a kingdom that will not be destroyed. And when we look at the beasts, I mean, the end of the beast is when their kingdom is destroyed by God. That God has had enough of them and he has, has dealt with them accordingly to their, their actions. But the Son of Man is given a kingdom that will never be destroyed. No other kingdom can rise up against it. No dominion can overtake it. It's one that will last forever. And maybe a third and, and kind of slightly smaller point is how the Son of Man handles himself before the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is there on his throne and the Son of Man comes to him and presents himself before him. There's a humility in that saying, I will do what you ask. I will obey your will. I will be your tool. And the beasts are ones that are openly fighting against him, speaking against him. And it's this, this change in attitude that is another differentiate or a different uh, characteristic between the Son of Man and the beast. And the Son of Man, I think, as we read through this, should strike out as Jesus. It, it's the Christ who, who comes to the earth and is that uh, the sacrifice that is, is given so that we can be saved. That we can have that opportunity of salvation before us. And Jesus even uses prophecies of Daniel as he affir to affirm who he is. I mean, he talks about it in Mark 14, 62, where, where he talks about the Son of Man coming from the heavens, talking about himself. Jesus is the king of the everlasting dominion and kingdom. And this was written way before Jesus ever came. This was written way before Babylon fell. This is written in the captivity of Israel. And Daniel is seeing this in a vision. And I think that's why we have to understand that this is such a, a shocking thing to Daniel. Because here he is in captivity. Things are going well for him. He's been elevated to, to a very high position. And now he's seeing visions of destruction, of death, of, of all this pain and suffering. And finally, at the very end of that, will come hope. And I mean, I think we have to understand why he's so shaken. He's scared. He doesn't know what it means. And that leads him to, to seeking out answers. Because Daniel then goes on to ask for an interpretation. And it's an interpretation of who these beasts are. If you look with me in verse 15, it says this. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. 
I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these sayings. The four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with his teeth of iron and claws of bronze, which devoured and broke into pieces, and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns which were on his head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them, until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth, and trample it down, and break it into pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom shall ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and a half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away, to be consumed and destroyed to the end. Daniel asks, well, what does this mean? I mean, I think he's talking about in his vision, he goes and, and it asks one of the people there. Maybe it's an angel, maybe it's just a holy, a holy one of God. And he just asks for help. Help me understand it. And his response is simple, that in verse 17, these four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. So we get this, uh, this answer. These four beasts, each one worse than the one before it, it's just another kingdom. So we have to ask ourselves, which of these kingdoms are, are we referring to? And I think actually it's, it's pretty simple to break down when we start to think history and Bible. The first of the beasts is, is the kingdom of Babylon. The lion with wings that becomes a man is a symbol of, of a rule that was given by God is now being taken away. I mean, think of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the king at the beginning of the Babylonian kingdom. And he captures Israel. He does, he carries out God's task and then is humbled. I mean, he is the exact example of, of, a, of this lion who, who is becoming or, or has the sanity of a man given to him. Because when we think of Nebuchadnezzar, he is punished for his pride. He has to go live out in the wilderness like an animal. And after a time, his then, then his sanity comes back and he becomes like a man. That's what Babylon is. Because when we think of Babylon, it was used by God to be this great terror to Israel. And it was. It defeated the kingdom. But then it fades away almost as quickly as it began. It has this frightening appeal, but the kingdoms that come after it are so far greater and much worse than it is. Because the second kingdom that comes, the one that is, is lined up to be that bear with the ribs in his mouth, is the kingdom... I apologize, I, I keep something keeps hitting on this. The kingdom that comes after Babylon is the kingdom of the Medo-Persians. And, and while the bear does seem to be this singular animal and kingdom, I, I don't think we need to get hung up on the duplicity of the name Medo-Persian. Because when we look at how Daniel talks about it, he refers to them as this single group. In fact, when we think of Darius, when he is making the decree about who, who the people can pray to, he issues a decree to the Medes and the Persians. And in fact, when we look in, in history, the Medes are just a, a subset of the Persian Empire. And, and that should help us understand that when the Medo-Persians are being described, not only here, but later in chapter 8, it's a singular kingdom. It's not multiples, it's just one with different people in it. And Darius is, is this great Persian king, and the Persian kings go on to have even more great success. In fact, when we really think about Persians in history, they're some of the most violent uh, aggressive people that ever lived on this earth. I mean, they're constantly warring against the Greeks and against the other nations at the time. I mean, we have great stories. And I, I say great to mean uh, uh, just these huge events. But we have great stories of Persians fighting the Greeks. I mean, we can think of the 300 at, at the Pass of Thermopylae or, or just the attack on Marathon by the Persians as they try to defeat this, this small fledgling nation. The Persians are this vast nation, and they do indeed devour flesh before them. They go out and they attack and they overcome different nations. And it's not until they run up against Greece that they fail. Because the third kingdom that actually is uh, referred to here by Daniel is the kingdom of the Greeks. 
And I, I put under over here under uh, parentheses under Alexander because it's not really until Alexander the Great that Greece becomes a unified nation. For so long before Alexander, they were fighting each other. I mean, when we think of Greece, we, we often think of the, the great city-states that, that come out of it. Sparta, Athens, Corinth. I, I mean, uh, there's so many uh, of those great uh, ancient names that we can think of that are Greek city-states. And for so long, they, they that's all they were. They weren't unified. They often fought against each other. I mean, we've got uh, wars such as the Peloponnesian Wars, where it's civil war in Greece. But once Alexander the Great becomes their leader... And he's from Macedon, which is just another uh, city-state in Greece. But once Alexander the Great becomes their leader, he unifies the entire kingdom against that threat of Persia. And he actually, he is the one who defeats the Persians. And after he defeats them, he embarks on this world domination tour that leads him into Asia. And when we really think of him, he lines up so well with that third, that third beast. Because as we see in the third beast, it's, it's given dominion. And when we think of Alexander the Great, he has given, or he, he establishes a kingdom that was known as the greatest kingdom at the time. It had such great dominion, it had far-reaching corners and, and borders, that it was this great dominion in the face of man. But then we get to the fourth beast. And the fourth beast is, is one that really uh, perplexes Daniel, because he needs further clarification. That it, It's not just enough to be told that it's going to become a, a four, uh, one of the four kings. Because he then goes on and asks different, uh, different questions. In fact, he brings up a, a point that he hadn't made before in verse 21. He says, as I look, this horn, which is uh, the one horn that sprouts up between the three horns on that beast, he says, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. I mean, simply speaking, he, he's talking about a, a horn that creates great suffering and persecution for the saints of God, God's people. And to me, when, when I look at this, I mean, there, there are some who look at the fourth beast and, and talk about how it's, um, it's just all of mankind after Greece. That it's just mankind giving into sin and worldliness and that there's just this trial that fights out. And I can understand that, you know, it, it, it's easy to look at that and think of the rise and fall in kingdoms, how there's sin and wickedness and all of that. But to me, there, there is no easier solution, no, no clearer solution to this fourth kingdom than that of Rome. Rome and the kingdom of, of uh, or the empire that it, it creates is so fitting to what is described in verses 23 through 26. And, and, and let me walk you through my mindset on this. In verse 23, it talks about this is a fourth kingdom that's going to be different from all the kingdoms, and it will devour the whole earth. Think of Rome, uh, Rome in its heyday. Rome really started out as this, this small city-state. Uh, back before there were countries as we think of them, as these great borders defining uh, countries, Rome was just a city down on the coast. It, it was just a city where, where the, the elements, the natural resources were there for, for the taking. And it was able to grow and grow. But ultimately, from that, that small city-state, it became this massive, massive kingdom. I mean, think about it. When we compare it to the other kingdoms, it is different than all the kingdoms that came before it. In terms of size, in terms of leadership, in terms of government precedence, in terms of uh, expansion and, and wealth, Rome is incomparable. In fact, it, it really does not have a comparison until you get to the modern day and age. That's how great this kingdom was. And not only is it different than the entire kingdom, but it devours the world. Think about the description that we're, we're talking about, that it's, when it's first introduced, it's talked about a, a, a beast that devours in broken pieces and stamps on what was left with its feet. It is a kingdom that will devour what's before it. I mean, just do a Google search for me. Look at the Roman Empire, a map of what it became, and you'll see the vastness of its borders. It stretches north and south from, from modern day United Kingdom all the way to the north coast of Africa. It stretches east and west from the borders of Spain to the borders of Asia. It is this vast empire that so many people, so many kingdoms have tried to replicate, but never can. I mean, if we want a modern day example, think of World War II with Germany under Adolf Hitler. That was a, a vast reach of empire. I mean, we can just look at that. I mean, we, we understand that Hitler was this terrible person, that he, he and the Germans did some terrible, terrible things. But man, they captured so much land. They were able to amass a kingdom that was, was vast. 
They stretch from their central location in Europe to all of, all of Europe, aside from the United Kingdom. That's how great that kingdom was. But then it didn't even last for more than three years. The kingdom of Rome stretched its borders from, from 50 BC all the way to about 530 AD was when, when Rome itself fell and when Constantinople moved the capital. The Roman Empire was so great, so vast, and had such a lengthy reign that it is incomparable to anything we might even think of today. And the prophecy, will specifically in verse uh, verse 24, speaks about ten kings. And it goes on to talk about three kings and another shall rise after them. And it may be easy to sit there and say, well, that's probably just Emperor Augustine all the way to Emperor Constantine. The simple understanding I think, I think we need to take from this is that is, this is just symbolism. The Roman have, Romans have so many emperors, and we could sit here and name off or try and count out how many there are. But I think the simple understanding, especially when we talk about what Daniel just revealed, that there is going to be persecution for God's people, is that the Romans have so many emperors who are an absolute terror to Christianity. We can think of names like Nero or Domitian and Diocletian, who all make it their personal goal to destroy the Christian faith. They make it their personal goal, personal goal to persecute Christians. And we can read so many tragedies and just awful events at the hands of these emperors. But that's the key, that these are our kings who set themselves against God's people. And one of them will rise out to be worse than all the rest. He will speak words against the Most High. He will wear out the saints of the Most High. Man, that, that just fits Rome to a T. Because it's this kingdom that has this, this vast destruction. That this, it just destroys the wills of people. But in the end, it, the goal of the prophecy is still the same. Jesus is the king. That even though Rome will reign for, for years after Jesus' death and resurrection, his dominion outlasts Rome. It outlasts any other kingdom that comes after Rome. It outlasts any kingdom that is there today. Jesus' dominion is going to defeat all dominions. His kingdom will defeat all kingdoms because Jesus is the son of man who has been given dominion by the ancient of days, by God. Chapter 7 is, is a great look into this prophecy, into not only this prophecy, but into history. And, and from this chapter, I think we do need to take away some application, help us kind of take a step back and say, well, how does this help me understand God? There really are three applications that I, I think we can make. The first of which is that Daniel's visions show God's plan was to work through many. God's plan was never just to be a, a one singular way. That he, he wasn't just going to use one kingdom, it was going to go all, all the way. He was using different people to, to deal with others, to show his power, to show his strength. From Babylon to, to Persia to Greece to, to Rome. And we can even bring that forward to today to, to the United States, to Great Britain, to uh, Germany, France, anything you want to name. God is using many to accomplish his will. And that's what we see from this vision, that his, his plan was, was multifaceted. It wasn't just one single way, but the goal was always the same. But he used so many people to do it. And when we think about today, that means he can use so many of us to do his will. Even if we try to visibly push back against it, God can still use us to accomplish what he wants from us. Secondly, I think we need to understand that history should not be ignored. But rather, we need to study history to see God's plan. When we look through the history books, we can read of the kingdoms of Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome. But when we compare that or use that to study the Bible... Man, it makes the Bible text so much greater and so so much more uh, helpful to our faith that when someone might try to poke holes into the Bible and where it falls, we can point to it and say, "Well, this was talking about kingdoms that never came or that that hadn't even come yet, and yet we know come because of historical finds, because of historical uh, developments. That's what proves the Bible is real. That's what proves God was doing all of this before it was even thought of by man." History shouldn't be ignored. We shouldn't just throw it out because it's boring or, or we, we find it not useful to us because it doesn't apply to us. But it always has a place to show us God's plan. And thirdly, I, I think we need to see that God is always in control. And that should make us joyful. Even in the face of, of persecution that Daniel is seeing, that he's seeing this, this wrath against the saints of God, God is still in control. And at the end of that, there is a reason to be joyful because he will send someone great to save his people. And we see that through Jesus, that he sent a, a savior 
So there's people at hope, even in the face of, of death and, and persecution. Daniel 7 is the start of a, a, a period in the book of Daniel of difficult to understand prophecies. And I'm sure there are some things in this that I've missed, that I've maybe even misunderstand or, or mis misstated, and I apologize for that if that's so. But we see that there's so much to unpack in these chapters. And I hope you, you will join with me over the next few weeks as we try to do so, as we try to look through it and understand what we can about these books or about these chapters. I appreciate your attention and I, and I, and I hope that if you have any questions or, or any things that, that you, you want to uh, try to understand better, maybe we can study together and, and look for more answers. But I hope that this study has been helpful and beneficial to you. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.